It's okay. It's all good, man. I tested negative. Our, our, our head coach. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, um, uh, as I said in the last hour, I am Roy Bell. I'm a missionary evangelist out of Bible Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm a pastor's mid service, and I know he would send uh, uh, our greetings from our church out there to your church right here. Amen. So, hey, this is what y'all were threatened with. So, this, this is the hour. Uh, uh, I was just talking to my, to my brother about we had to, uh, uh, you know, put on a, put on your crash dummy helmet or tighten your seat belts. Uh, uh, my story, I have not always been a missionary evangelist. Amen. Uh, we were singing earlier. We were singing, home to stray, home to wander, home to leave the God I love. Amen. And that is that that you know there was a there was a hymn that uh, would go with what I was telling you all about this morning. That would be one. And then we sang about beautiful land. And why anyone would ever stray? Why would anyone ever want to stray or wander from beautiful land? You know. But thank God for for the mighty God that 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 made a way that made a way for for, for folks to get back, for folks to get back to beautiful Amen. land. When they, when they get off, and I'm here to tell you this morning that the detour leads back to the main highway. Mm -hmm. And I, I preface this that, you know, if this is, my story is like something you might see in a movie or something like that, but it is in no way, shape, or form uh, intended to glorify sin or, or, or the devil that destroyed half my life with it. And uh, so uh, we, we give all, all glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, Amen. This, this, this morning. Amen. If you would go with me uh, to a familiar, very familiar portion of Scripture in Luke uh, chapter uh, 15. Luke chapter 15. You know why you're turning there, you know, I was thinking, Pastor. Um, I just wonder this. I don't know this authoritatively, but with Watchman Nee, and he was over in China, so he was he was he was teaching and preaching in Chinese. I wonder if the 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 wrong Bible uh, 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 got thrown in there by the translators. Hmm. I wonder because I don't think I don't think he taught I taught or preached or taught in English over there. To, no, to the best of my knowledge, it, that may not have been his fault. That, that could, <laughs> could be. I don't know. It's, it's worth that, looking that, into. That could be. But no, yeah. hey, hey you, any of you that got um, that book uh, today, uh, I'm telling you that will rev that that that's you know that there's so many books out there. It's self help Christian book. I mean, there's shelves and warehouses are full of them, but. You know, someone would have asked me the top five books that I would recommend that any new believer get and read. That'd be one of them. That'd be Amen. one of them for sure. Amen. Okay, Luke uh, and chapter 15, and uh, we'll start reading in the 11th verse. And, uh, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to, and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had <clears throat> compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto, unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
that the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Father, thank you again uh, uh, this morning. Uh, we ask you, Lord, to uh, intercede. Uh, Father, just to, uh, to some, somehow, some way, though, though, I, though I'm talking about me, just take me out of the way, Lord. And, um, I just ask, Father, that uh, uh, my heart would be, would be right and pure and good with you and that I would be a, a channel to uh, say um, what you would have said in here this morning and, and be careful to give all honor and all glory to you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we look at the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, and uh, again, there's there's a couple different ways we can look at it. Um, we can look at it as pertaining to the nation of Israel. Um, we, we can look at it uh, as a lost person fight, finding the Lord, or we could, we could look at it as a believer that, that backslides because you know he's, he's already he's already a son of the father right so uh, that's that's the way personally that um, in a spiritual personal application that I that I read I read because that was me that was me um, I spent thirty years of my life in prison I uh, Grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. My uh, my dad was a casino boss. He died when I was 10 years old, and my mom had to go to work. So, uh, I hit, as they say, fell in with the bad crowd. Mom was at work. I was a I was a young kid, and I fell in with the bad crowd. Um, smoked uh, smoked my first joint when I was get uh, 13, uh, going on my 14th birthday. It was around Christmas time. I remember that. And, uh, you know, they've made that stuff legal nowadays. You know, you got, I mean, you go, I don't, I don't know what it is in Arkansas, but in Nevada and other places that, that I've just driven past in my hometown, I mean, they've got marijuana sh stores right there on, on the corner. I mean, you know, this, and it's not for medical. This is, this is for partying. I mean, that's uh, the marijuana shops, big shops. It's crazy. Um, and, you know, people say, well, you know, not everybody that tries marijuana gets strung out on hard drugs. So, you know, I'll grant you that. You know, not everybody that has a sip of wine once in a while becomes an alcoholic. But uh, let me just say this. As somebody who spent 30 years of his life in the penitentiary, I never met a, a, a drug addict or, or a drunkard in my life that didn't start with the first joint. The first drink. So, yeah, no, maybe, maybe everybody ain't gonna go down that road. Oh, but a lot of them will. A lot of them will, and I have seen the carnage, the carnage of destroyed lives from drugs and alcohol. So there, you know, there, there ain't no, there ain't no good little sit here, and there ain't no good little tote there. And within six months of smoking my first joint, I basically tried every single drug there was. I was I, I, I was I was so fascinated by this phenomenon and liked it so much that uh, uh, I said, well, this 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 is how you become one of the cool kids is you got to be the one with the dope. So uh, at age 14, going on 15 years old, I'm climbing up on the top of uh, department stores and shopping centers, going through the air conditioning ducts of pharmacies and, uh, uh, and, and, and clearing them out as a kid. I mean, I, I drive my little boat, my motocross bicycle. I lean it up against the, the back of the building with my little pillowcase, climb up the, the pipe on the side of there, go in there, fill up that pillowcase, go back, tie it to the handlebars of my thing, and boy, next day in school, I was a big man on campus. You can bet that. I, I'd read the position's desk reference, so I knew exactly what I was looking for on the shelves. And I had the big plastic bottles, you know, that you see on the pharmacy shelves, not the little ones that give you your, your, your thing in, but the big one they come out of, and I'd have one of those stuck in each sock. Oh, and I had platform shoes and bell bottoms, by the way, because we're, we're talking about, we're talking about the mid-70s. And I was, I was walking the hallways of school with the <laughs> bottles of pills, <laughs> you know, and folks were just following me around like this. 
So anyways, but we're kids and kids fell. And so I got told I got kind of ended up going to reform school, youth prison or whatever, three times. Turned 18, they kicked me out. Wasn't that about two minutes before I had an adult conviction and a suspended sentence to the Nevada, Nevada State Prison. And uh, one thing about me is I've always been real little. Uh, uh, when I when I was going to school, there was never even a girl smaller than me. Uh, when I first got to high school, they used to pat me on the head and say, "Aren't you in the wrong school, little boy?" So when I was when I was 18 years old, I looked about 13, and I was pretty. <laughs> so my best friend, God bless him, he ended up getting saved. He's in heaven now, but he got he got saved later on. But, but he was just my he was just my old road dog, my running buddy, my crime partner out there. My best friend Kenny. He said, "Man, you fixing to go to prison, and it ain't time. Man, you ain't gonna you ain't gonna make it in prison." So my friend he threw me in the truck, and, and we we just headed out across the country and ended up in Sarasota, Florida. <laughs> I'm talking to my brother back here, Sarasota, Florida, and, and and lived down there a couple of years, and I can got away from the hardest of the drugs, but, you know, c continued to get into drugs, and then I fell in with the, um, some outlaw bikers down there, and I began to travel around and hang out with these outlaw bikers, and started getting back into the hard drugs, uh, and we started doing burglaries, but what we were burglarizing was uh, um, gun stores now, and then we had, a, they, they, were the, they were the second generation of the peace, peacemakers out of Toledo, Ohio, and um, the, these were the kids of the original bikers that started the club. And so they had an old connection way, way, way down in the Rio Grande Valley in South, South Texas, as far as you could go uh, down, down there. And uh, so we, we would, were living down there. And so we were, giving, we were giving them the guns and they were taking them south of the border and would trade, trade, and trade it for drugs which we were taking north of the border. And now fast forward, it's now I'm getting ready to turn 21 years old. I've been on the run for the law, from the law these years, and and I, and I did not grow up in a Christian household. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I had never been to church a day in my life. Uh, just from watching TV, I thought Jesus and the Bible were like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, and like you know, yeah, spare me, you know, that, that's nonsense. And uh, but I, I was down there, uh, and I remember I was getting right there on my 21st birthday, and sitting out in front of this little apartment full of outlaw bikers and Mexican drug dealers. And I was out there one night, and I just looked up at the stars and stuff, and I was just like, so this is it, huh? This is, this is how Roy Bell ends up, you know? I said, yeah. And if there, if there is anybody out there, you know, I need some help. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mess, and it looks like a dead end to me. And uh, so guys around, the, guys around there started talking about uh, somebody was coming down. Big Dave Break. Big Dave Break, I guess, was one of the originals of the Peacemakers, the Motorcycle Club. And uh, though they, they start telling Big Dave stories. They come up, oh, Big Dave is six foot nine, and he kicked in the bar door, went in there and whooped the whole other motorcycle club. And, oh, Big Dave took a shotgun and went over here and did that. And, I mean, to hear the big hear about Big Dave, he was he, he was King Kong, Batman, Kung Fu, Bruce Lee, and James Bond all put together. Big Dave's coming down. Oh, okay, all right. Well, Big Dave showed up. He pulled up down there on, on his motorcycle and uh, coming up the stairs. And I knew, as soon as I saw Dave break, that whatever this man had is what I'd been looking for all my life. And I didn't know how to explain it, but I looked at that guy and I said, whatever it is, this guy knows the secret of life. This guy has got what I look for. This guy has got what I need. And he come up there and he sat down on that couch in that apartment full of outlaw bikers and Mexican drug dealers. Well, but Big Dave had got saved. He was a biker for Jesus now. And Big Dave sat up in there and began to tell us about Jesus Christ mm. on, that, on, on that couch, in that apartment right there. And I can remember the very words that this, that, that, that this Bible, this word is, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And I can remember when the light of that sword, of that word, pierced through into the darkness of my heart. And I can remember the very moment the lights came on. He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. 
And I'm telling you, it went off in me like a rocket. God reached down there, flipped an on switch, and I was like, that's it. If Jesus is real and the Bible is true, it's Jesus in the Bible. It's Jesus in the Bible. I can't believe it. No way. No. And I'm telling you, I was gloriously, I was wonderfully, Apostle Paul, Damascus Road, I was saved, man. I mean, wow. Now, the started going to the little Baptist church just around the corner, up the road, and I mean, I, I, I went there every day. They didn't even wait for service. I just went there and hung out. And I'm telling you, on my way to church every day, the sun was shining, the birds were singing. I was walking that, that high off the ground. This was just revolutionary. This was amazing to me. And uh, there was a little boy from that church who had got sent to the Les one of the Lester Roloff affiliated boys' homes was the Shepherd's Lane in Tennessee. And uh, when he, his boy's name was John Orcott. And when John Orcott uh, uh, got to that boy's home, there was a, a lake that froze over. And the director of that boy's home, little boy came out and he fell through the ice. And this little boy, John Orcott, dived in. And he, he got the director's little boy out. But then he slipped back under and he passed away. And so they brought the body of John Orcott down to this down to this little Baptist Southern Baptist Church, First Baptist Church of Mission, Texas. I've been saved two weeks. They brought the body down for the funeral of the church where I'm at. And you picture I'm two, I, 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 I'm two weeks into salvation. I still got hair out to here. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a mess. But man, I was happy. I was happy. And so Brother Bob Wills, Bob and Betty Wills. Uh, worked with Brother Roloff many years. They had the Shepherd's Lane and they had the Redemption Ranch uh, at, at right outside of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And they came in with four boys. Four boys from the Redemption Ranch Boys Home for the funeral of John Orcott. And you know, I've been to reform school and youth prison three times. But I saw these, these, these four boys each come up there clean cut in their suits and sharp and give their testimony and man I said I said wow wow service was over I went to brother up went up to brother Bob Wills I said can I go with you <laughs> I remember hey he was sitting right there <laughs> praise God and I went and I said and so brother Bob Wills said well what are you saying uh, uh Roy <laughs> yeah God. I said you want to be a missionary I said that's it yeah, I want to be a missionary. He said, well, okay. He said, well, we'll be, uh, he said, we'll be leaving uh, first thing in the morning. I said, I'll be ready. So we, I didn't have much. I packed my little, my little bag, met up with them. We got way, way south Texas, so we started heading north on our way back to the Redemption Ranch. We hit, we hit Corpus Christi. So spent the night on Lester Roloff's living room floor. And, uh, um, and he, he got up that morning and fixed us breakfast. And he took one look at me and he asked Brother Wills, he said, who is that? <laughs> Brother Wills says, well, that's, that's, that's Brother Roy. He's, he's going to be a missionary. And I'll never forget it. Brother Roloff said, you're going to get him a haircut, ain't you? He's going to look like one of our boys. <laughs> and amen, I got, I got to the Redemption Ranch and it was a spiritual greenhouse for me. Uh, six, six months I was I was there uh, going, you know, I was I was 21. I was helping in the kitchen. And I, you know, I don't know what I was. But I wasn't a kid in the program, but I did everything with them. And all the scripture memory, all the daily chapel, all, all the Schofield reference Bible. All, and we'd go into town, the Central Baptist Church in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We'd go into there. And after about six months, um, they had a little Bible college there, Southland Baptist Bible College at Central Baptist Schools. And I went into town, and I fell in love. I fell in love with Miss Kathy. Miss Kathy was, had her own bus route. Miss Kathy was the one that had the most uh, contest. Independent Fundamental Baptist Church had the most converts down the aisle every year, baptized from her soul, from soul winning nights. Miss Kathy got saved when she was in fourth grade and opened the front of her Bible and wrote down everything she was going to do. I'm going to go to House Anderson College. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to marry a preacher. I'll never wear pants off. Now. You know she had all of her listen. I'll tell you something. I found out later on in life that she kept stuck everything she wrote in her Bible when she was in fourth grade and got saved. 
and uh, and I fell in love with her, and we 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 began we began to court uh, in the most proper, independent, fundamental that ways. We had never held hands. We always had a chaperone. But oh man, I you know I ain't even been saved long. And I was in love, I was in love. And I was like, I, I was 21, she was 18. And I was like, look, let's just get married and start this ministry, man, I'm, I'm ready to go. And she said, no, I wrote in my Bible. When I was in fourth grade, I'm going to Hiles Anderson College. So it's not time for me. I've got to go finish my education and go to Hiles Anderson College. She went up to Hiles Anderson College. I was heartbroken. So what did I do? I went, I followed her to Hiles Anderson College. <laughs> but that was out, out, out of the will of God, of course, you know. And uh, so I got up there, and, and her dad uh, uh, had told her that she he didn't like my path, so I don't want you dating him. So she said, my dad said I can't date you. So after we're seeing each other in classes and hallways, and I said, Kathy, look, if you can look me in the eye and tell me you don't love me, I'll, I'll never bother you again. And so she started crying. No, I do. Uh, I got to go talk to my dad again. Now I'm happy. She said, I'm going to talk to my dad one more time. I said, yeah, right. So I get back, I get back to the dormitory room. Eight guys there in the little dormitory. Now, there was this guy in the dormitory. His name was Ralph. And you understand, I ain't gonna say very long. I come from a little bit of a rough, rough background. I got a few rough edges, you know. And Ralph was that guy that was gonna point out every single one of them, you know. And that I could not do or say anything. But Ralph was like, Ralph was, Ralph was on the left nerve already. And I come in, one of the guys was super cool. I ran to him, I was like, man, I just talked to Kathy. She's gonna call her dad. It's gonna be all good and everything. And a little Ralph pops up and starts talking, I don't see, I don't see what's so special about her. I, I don't see what you see here or anything. I think she, and I, I just kind of turned around to him and just kind of went, like, shut up. <laughs> and he made the mistake of, of doing that back to me. And uh, I cleaned his grill for him real good. You don't do that, Hyle Madison. You don't do that in Bible college. So the next day, Meanwhile, overnight, Kathy's called her dad. Her dad freaked out. He calls the school and says, you get that boy out of there, or we're gonna, our church is gonna pull all, everybody we've sent to that school out. So next day, I'm in the dean's office, and of course, I, I'm a stalker. They got the dad calling, I just bust So that, that was the end of Bible college for me at that point. And uh, so I said, well, just, I got bitter, I got angry. I, I said, I'm just going back to Las Vegas. I don't know what happened with all this. I got brainwashed. I got caught up in the cult. I don't know what happened. But I'm, I'm done. This, 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 this was all stupid. This was wrong. I got fooled, whatever. I'm going back to Las Vegas. So I go back to Las Vegas. I'm ready to tell you that you can't run from somebody who lives inside of you. <laughs> uh, but if anybody, if anybody gave it a good try, if anybody did the Jonah thing uh, to, to its fullest extent, it was me. And this is a cautionary tale. This is a cautionary tale. So I went back to Las Vegas. I tried to convince myself, I, you know, the brain lock, whatever. Um, that began, and I'm not going to take you through my entire life, but, but, but that began the run. And there was a few times during the run where I tried to come back a little bit, and it just, it just didn't pay. I fall away again. The Bible says a just man falls seven times and, and rises up again. My life's verse is the, uh, Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it under the yeah. day of Jesus Amen. Christ. So he has he has shown himself faithful in that. But I mean this this is this is why this is such a crazy story. People want to tell tell your story, Roy. Look, I never went to prison until after I got saved. Some of you guys who get saved in prison? No, uh, <laughs> I, I, I ran from God, and like Jonah, <laughs> Jonah went, he went down, he went down to Tarshish, he went down in the boat, <laughs> he, went, he went down into the whale's belly, he went down into hell, I went to prison four times after I was saved, but that's what it took. That's what God allowed me to go through yeah, so I could finally tap out and do what he called me to do. And uh, you know, during during this is this is this is Father's Day, um, during during one of those times between prison that uh, uh, sentences, I had uh, uh, I got married and I had a daughter and uh, um, she's she's my best friend today. Her name's Haley. She's twenty eight years old, I have two beautiful grandchildren and but uh, but I went back to prison, she was four years old. And I went back to prison. And I ended up doing a total of 30 years of my life in prison. I uh, ended up with uh, 12 
felony convictions for armed robbery, many of them bank robberies. Uh, I have received two habitual criminal enhancements and I have two felony prison escapes. Uh, my nickname on the yards there in prison was Houdini. So they, they called me Roy, where'd he go, Bell. Because I get out <laughs> and uh, I get out and go back on another crime spree, I mean, it was, it was madness. It was ab absolute, absolute madness running from God. Running from God, trying, trying to feel, trying to feel that what we talked about in that hour, that 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 relationship, that excuse me, that fellowship, that fellowship with the Father, that joy that was that was missing, trying to fill it with everything else out there in the world. And I'm here to tell you, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. There is nothing out in that world that 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 for more than that long is even going to give you a tingle. It's not going to fulfill you. It's not going to please you. It's not going to help you. There is nothing of this world that is going to in any way, shape, or form do anything but pull you down and destroy you, grieve you, make your life miserable, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the things thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. James says, if any man will make himself a friend of this world, he makes himself the enemy of, uh, the enemy of God. And the Bible says that who the Lord loves, that he, 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 he chastens. So here I was, here I was, the young man who just... Took, took his goods and went and squandered them, wasted his substance with riotous living. And I tell you, pleasure and sin but for a season. And he said that in verse 4 it says, He began to be in want. I began to be in want. It starts out pretty good. But listen, sin, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It's going to keep you longer than you want to stay. And it's going to have you doing stuff you never thought you would do. Amen. It's a dead end road. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. Can I say, can I say, I can say this about any other being? And certainly not about a person on the planet. But the devil, you know, go to hell. Please, hurry up. Go to hell. The devil needs to go to hell. And, and, and he is a he is a liar and a scumbag and, and and listen I can't whoop him oh hallelujah but my Lord did Amen. but my Amen. Lord did I would never even try to approach him in my own strength and in my own power but praise God there was one who did who said let us come together face to face let us contend with one another and there and there on Calvary's cross. By, by, by using the devil's own power of death, the Lord Jesus Christ used death, sin and death, and, and, and the devil, and a perfect trifecta, and bashed all three of their heads together and came up victorious. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. My Savior lives, and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Now my life is worth the living. Because he lives. And only because he lives. And he was so patient with me. And that detour it ended up leading to the back to the main highway. This happened. This was uh, 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 2010. I, they took me out of the oven too early again, preacher. I wasn't done. I wasn't done. That can't fail again. I, that, 2010, they let me out. I didn't stay out 10 months. I was back in. Not only back in, what I had done this time is I got a Harley Davidson XL 1200 Sportster. And uh, I went around and started pulling stick ups in, in, in Las Vegas. They were looking at me for 13 of them. They called me the motorcycle bandit. Uh, they finally caught me after a 45, after I'd done a robbery, they had a 45 minute police chase, 40, 40 squad cars, a helicopter. Finally got, it, finally got me. I couldn't outrun that helicopter. I was handcuffed, laying on the hood of that cop car. 50 years old. And I said to myself at that moment, I said, well, I'm dying in prison now. And I got to prison. And I was like, you know, listen, I'm not mad at God because I, I know I got this coming. 
I know I did this to myself. I should be dead. He should have killed me. So uh, just the very fact I'm still living and breathing is a blessing from God. And I get to prison and I'm finally I'm done. I'm finally, finally done. I don't want any more dope. I don't like dope anymore. And, and I, I, I mean, and I'm like, Lord, couldn't we have done this 20 years ago? <laughs> it would save me a whole lot. But God, God knows the beginning from the end. All things work together for good. And, 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 and so I, I was done. I knew it. And this night stayed away from church. I stayed away from God's people because you know what? I was tired of disappointing people. I was tired of making God look bad. So I didn't go to chapel. I wasn't going to be a hypocrite. You know, I thought if I, I could live the devil, I was going to live the devil good. But finally, the Lord said, you know, what's holding you back now? He said, I don't want the dope. That's when I always worried. Man, yeah, I'll go, but eventually a day will come and I'll want the dope again. And, and I'll, you know, even the, So I was, I was just running on willpower. Because the desire was still there. But at this point in time, I had just been through so much. Like I said, down, this is my fourth time in prison. Now I got a life, you know, they gave me a life sentence. I got a large habitual criminal life sentence, 50 years old. I'm in prison, I'm done. I just, and, and, and it just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I knew I was done with the door. I just knew, I knew, I knew. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to have my relationship with my father back. My, 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 excuse me, my fellowship with my father back. I just wanted to have the joy of the Lord again. I just wanted to have some peace. I remember, I remember the times walking with the Lord. I said, if I'm going to be here in prison for the rest of my life, I said, I, I, I at least want to do it with the Lord. So I, I came, I came back, I came back, and and, and it, it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard. It, it says right. It said I came to myself. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And I arose, and I came to my father. And uh, not only did I come to, to my father, but I came back to the chapel. Uh, we had our chapel. I mean, I'll tell you, uh, the, the High Desert State Prison, where I did the, my uh, last ten or so years, our chapel was almost almost the size of this, and we had a baptismal, and we had the, the choir and the instrument. I mean, it was a really really nice church under a wonderful chaplain, Chaplain Julio Calder, and best chaplain on the on the face of the planet. But I came back, and that's what I said. I said, look, uh, you know, I per was pretty certain that this ministry thing the ship had sailed you know I, I, that was that was that was done but i just wanted to be in church i just wanted to be in the in the atmosphere in the presence and and have my joy and my peace and my fellowship and so i came back to that old church chapel i sat way back there in the back and i thought i ain't gonna bother nobody i'm just happy to be here but god won't want have it like that it wasn't but a hot second they started calling me. Uh, Brother Roy, would you open us up in a word of prayer? Uh, Brother Roy, and they start coming. Brother Roy, would you? I'm like, hey, who told you? <laughs> and uh, so, long story short, it was not but a hot second. Oh, and let me say this too. While I was in prison, uh, uh, I got a pen pal. Um, I wrote him, and he and he wrote me back, and he continued to write me faithfully for 25 years. He sent me every single book that he ever wrote, some more than once. Uh, but that was Dr. Dr. Peter S. Rutman. And he became my long distance teacher, Bible teacher, mentor, pen pal, and friend. I never got to meet him. He, he went yeah. to heaven before I got out. Yeah. But um, he sent he sent me this old this old Rutman Records Bible. As soon as it came out, he sent me this in prison. It's my it's my most valued material possession on the face of the planet. I was telling the preacher earlier, I said if, if the house was burning down, uh, I get one thing, I'm going in for this. You know, and I'll I'll, I'll take some third degree burns to get it. Amen. But so in, in that chapel, at High Desert, 4,000 man prison, High Desert State Prison, right outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, um, within a short amount of time, I was, uh, I was the chaplain's assistant, um, and, and this, this good Bible-believing Baptist brother, he turned the whole Christian program over to me. So I spent basically the last decade as the chaplain of the, of the Christian church in High Desert State Prison. And it was such a big prison that every unit had its own church day. You know, you couldn't get everybody in there. So, you know, Monday was unit one, Tuesday was unit two, 
So my job for the last decade I was in prison was to get up, go up to the chapel, and hold church. And I was cool with that because I had life. Everybody said, no, he's never getting out. He's never getting out. I had a possibility of parole. But listen, when you got 12 felony convictions, multiple armed robberies, two felony prison escapes, you've been to prison four times. Look, you don't, you don't, you don't make your parole board. <laughs> so uh, I was there, and I was good with that. Because I, I find out I was in God's will. I was doing exactly, I was doing exactly what God called me to do. I was in the center of God's will. I had peace. I had joy. I did not feel like a man in prison. I just felt like a missionary who lived lived on the field. And I, and I was good. I, I'm like. This is great. Until you take me home or, or, or the rapture comes, I, I'm great with this. I got the joy. People always talk about, how are you so happy in prison, man? I'm, in, I, I, I'm finally finally walking with my with my father. I'm in fellowship with my father, hallelujah, on this Father's Day. And, 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 and then God sent COVID to this world. And the police quit coming to work. <laughs> and they slammed the prison doors. And they didn't let us out for two years. No sunshine, no exercise, no fresh air, nothing. Bam, we were caught in that little bathroom, two dudes stuck on a bunk, bam, for two years. They were barely finding some old bologna, fake mystery meat bologna to throw under the door to keep us alive. The police weren't coming to work. They were like, what are we going to do? They said, look, anybody who ain't killed somebody that's eligible for ever and ever and ever eligible for parole, we got to let them go. And May 3rd, two years ago, May 3rd, God, God, God let me out. God let Amen. me out of the high desert state prison. Amen. And, uh, and my daughter, um, who, I went to prison when she was four years old. I watched, I watched my daughter grow up in pictures. I was a bad dad. But God knit together our hearts. She opened, she opened her home to me when I got out. My first year and a half out, I, I lived with her and my granddaughter, my, my son-in-law, and we became a family again. And I'm here to tell you today that she is my best friend. We are, there. I'm not saying we're closer than anybody else, but there ain't any father and daughter anywhere closer than my daughter and I. We, we're, like, we're like two silly girlfriends texting each other all day, every day. What are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? Why are you going to hold this? That, that's me and my daughter. And, and, and she got saved. I wasn't there, but the father was, and he was faithful. She got saved when she was seven years old, and she lived for the Lord her whole life, and she married her high school sweetheart, her first love. And I have now I have two beautiful grandchildren. And uh, the, the church that was coming out there ministering with us, Bible Baptist Church in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, had been coming out for years. So it was no, there was no question. I, I went to Bible Baptist Church, and, and that's my that's my church when I got out. And this the, God has opened the doors, and I, and I, I started a, an online ministry through my uh, old school Bible Baptist, my my uh, YouTube channel, and my Facebook ministry where I met your pastor, and some of you might have been on there. Uh, today it uh, has uh, almost 3,000 subscribers. Uh, the videos are, are being watched somewhere between um, 15 and 20,000 times a month. And I've Amen. met wonderful, wonderful brothers in the Lord, King James Bible believing uh, uh, Baptist <laughs> Bible Baptist pastors across this country, and, and 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 they've been gracious enough to give this old jailbird from the slammer a chance. And, Brother Roy, if you're ever our way, come on in. We'll have you speak to our people. And I took one trip last summer, and this is this is my second trip. They only gave me 30 days last year. Now, now, the favor of God, not only do I have to apply for it, my PO sent me the template for the, I'm on parole for life, template for the travel pass. My parole officer, my parole officer sent me that template on the computer and he said just fill out just fill out whatever you need and send it to me I'll sign it and email it back to you so I get I get I get to go where I where I want to go wherever God calls me I get to go for when I want for as long as I want and uh, uh, and, and, and and preach and teach the King James Bible and salvation <laughs> dispensationally rightly divided uh, 
by grace through faith across uh, across the country and uh, and and I tell you um, it is just a, 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 a miracle and a blessing and that that I didn't I didn't have to go through a whole a whole lot but but the father was already there and he was already he was already coming to meet me and he, and he already he already had he already had the plans with the with the, with the shoes the, the best he put the best robe on me and he put the and he put shoes on my feet and he's made provision and killed it he restored my family and and, 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 and put me back and I would be back in the ministry and so I'm just I'm just I'm just so glad because I'll, I'll close with this this is basically what he did to this old this old knucklehead all right he grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and he opened up a concrete box with a steel door and he threw me in there and he took a King James Bible and he slung it in there after me and he said now listen you learn that book the way you're supposed to learn that book and you get your heart right where you can do something with it and maybe maybe someday I'll come open this door slam 30 years later 30 years later, we stand here today in those times when Timothy talks about knowing this, that in the last days, huh? that, that in the latter times, amen, in the lay of the sin, in this time and age where you look around you and you know everything that's happening in the world, the Lord told you it was going to happen. He told you it was going to happen right before he comes back, that this is exactly what, this is exactly, exactly what the world was going to look like. And I'm just so glad that he came and unlocked that door and let me come out here in these last few moments that are left to this world and do what he called me to do that all that time ago. He, he is faithful. Even though we deny him, he remains faithful. And that if there's anybody in your life that you that you know you pray for, you worry about, you just don't see any kind of way. Listen, there were so many years of my life if you'd have, you'd have known me, nobody could have convinced you that I was saved. Nobody convinced you that I'd ever be a preacher. But we don't know. We don't know. God is going to do what God is going to do. And again, the detour leads back to the main highway. So I guess I, I would say this morning, as we sit in the Sunday school hour, when Adam, when Adam sinned, God came in the garden and he said, where are you? Where are you? He wasn't asking him which bush he was hiding behind. He wanted Adam to acknowledge where Adam was. Where Adam was. There are a lot, there, there are a lot more prisons than just geographical steel and concrete boxes. There are a lot more prisons. And we can be in prison out here. Where are you? Where are you this morning? Where are you on this Father's Day? Is there fellowship with the Father?